盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘 ，Psychos。Part two: Further analysis and discussion. In our previous instalment, we spoke about how intellectual playfulness allows us to try out new perspectives, explore new ideas, and avoid falling into the traps that lurk within our existing belief systems. When I read the paper, T, one of the things that came to mind, and something you go on. To suggest in the paper yourself is that playfulness will only encourage us to explore new belief systems when they're fun. Yet there are lots of topics which aren't much fun. I'm thinking logic, climate change, baseball. What do you make of this criticism <laughs> that the requirement of fun significantly limits the power of playfulness? Yeah, I mean, one of the problems is every motivational. Set for exploring the territory is going to limit you in some way. One of the profoundest things that philosophy has to reckon with is the fact that we're limited beings and we have limited attention, and each motivational set is going to carve up the space in a different way. So I think, in some ways, it's good to have a lot of different reasons to explore. Right. And the more you have, the more you'll explore the space. So some reasons you can explore for truth-seeking reasons, and that that will narrow you to what's plausible. You can explore for fun, and that'll、mm -hmm. narrow you to the ideas that are fun. You can explore empathetically, which means you know exploring things because you feel connected to someone, you feel empathy for them. But that limits you to the people you're around that you feel emotionally connected to, which can be conditioned by、mm -hmm. various forms of, say, racial bias. Or cultural bias, you can explore for what's beautiful, right? You can look for theories that are beautiful instead of fun, and that will like a lot of the people I know that are drawn to logic and to drawn to really odd theories in logic are drawn to them for their beauty and elegance, and not because they're fun. And so I think actually it's really good to explore in these different、mm -hmm. ways. And in the paper that you have, what I said was it's good for you to cycle between these and have lots of them. And now I think that might be true, but even better. Might be an intellectual community、mm. in which you had some people that were more empathetic, and some people that were more playful jokester, asshole, chaoticians, <laughs> and some people that were completely seriously minded. And and sometimes what you might need is someone who's just fully committed to one of these paths、mm. to do the best kind of exploration. There's a in the paper you read. There's like a contradiction in it, and I've been working it out with this thought that like. Oh, I was too individualistic. I've always been trying to be less individualistic, but even that paper, I was still like,、oh, it's got to be. It's in you. It, you are the perspective shifter. And now I'm like, no, that's not how it works. What, how it works is, I'm the jokester in a lot of my intellectual communities. On the topic of having empathy for other people, T, in our episode with Rachel Fraser, we spoke about the power of narratives in conveying knowledge of personal experiences、yeah. and moral truths. Uh, do you think that games allow us to tap into these narratives in a way that's epistemically distinct from other means of understanding narrative? One of the things I've always wrestled with is this description of games as a narrative,、mm. and I think they're really interestingly different. Maybe at a very high level of abstraction, there's some way in which you can describe as a game as a narrative,、mm. but. When I look at actual, one of the reasons I started working on games was I was reading things that took either theories of fiction or theories of narrative to games, and、mm. they would emphasize elements like story, cinematics, script, character, and they would de-emphasize things like decisions, freedom, difficulty, skill. The tool set is really different, and. One way to think about it is that narrative is a really broad term, but your basic experience of a fiction work is of a fixed emotional perspective that's been pre-prepared and a set of events that you're experiencing.、Hmm. And your basic experience of a game is decision points in which you exert agency and make choices, and where what happens depends on your choices. And I think that's a very basically different way to do things. And each has its own strengths and weaknesses.、Yeah. Most of the fictions we have, and it, in Rachel Fraser's work, what we get out of narrative is this finely developed, well-tuned alternate emotional perspective. Right? This is this is Martha Nussbaum to you that like that one of the things that narratives are incredibly good at is. Putting us into a finely sculpted other、mm. emotional world and letting us understand what it's like to be in this place of another person with a specific emotionality.、Mm. Some games use a lot of the tools of narrative, but a lot of others, chess, rock climbing, right? 
Mm-hmm. They're not about shifting you to another emotional perspective. They're about shifting you into a different practical perspective. And how far do you think this perspective goes? You write in your book, I myself could never directly know what it's like to work as a woman in corporate America in the 1950s, but I can get a glimmer of that experience through a narrative and get some of the emotional attunement too. So given enough time and detail, could a VR simulation give you the same experience? Or would it still be wrong to get out of the machine and say, hey, now I know what it's like to be a woman in 1950s corporate America? (laughs) I don't think anybody thinks that reading a novel will give you the full knowledge of that perspective, but it gives you something more than you had before, right? It gives you, some people say empathy, some ability to model, some understanding. Like I, I feel like there are books I have read and after reading them, I am much more finely tuned to the ways it is screwed up to be a woman in this world. Mm. People try to do this with games, but most of the times when I see games that try to give this very specific, thick, experiential, emotional thing, they often do it through the non-game parts. They do it through the cutscenes. They do it through script. They, they, it's not the gaminess. The gaminess seems to get you at something else. So my theory has been that a lot of what games do is they create and transfer different forms of agency. Hmm. The ways they do it are by transferring and describing desires and abilities. So when I was working on this stuff, I found this talk that really helped uh, from the legendary board game designer Reiner Knizia. This is the genius of German <laughs> Euro game, like board game design. This is someone for whom if you share a certain geeky love of board games with me, he's like the Mozart or the Beethoven. He's he's amazing. And what he said was that the most important tool in his game design toolbox was the point system because the, the point system specifies what the players care about. So in some sense, and there's a very literal sense in which, oh, you're collecting gold, you're collecting sheep. So Knizia has these great point systems where you have to collect five things, but your points, what your score in the end of the game is, is whichever category you have the least in. Mm -hmm. And so now the point system is telling you to focus on your weakness. And that sculpts a particular kind of agency. It's You're free in a game and you get to make choices, but your choices are in this incredibly carefully sculpted and constrained space that often sends your attention down a very tight channel. Just um, thinking about intellectual playfulness for a second rather than just games, uh, you might think that for a lot of the big questions in philosophy, we need empathy for other people's situations and how they might react to a particular problem, such as, like you mentioned stuff before, like, you know, it could be like what it's like to be a woman, sexual identity, the morality of war, the meaning of their existence. Now, the question here, and I know that you've mentioned that you promote the idea of like an ecosystem of different types of thinkers. So it's not just a bunch of quote unquote laughing sages bouncing around just being not very serious, you're encouraging lots of different types of thinking, but there could be a situation where the presence of at least one laughing sage may be inappropriate uh, in that particular context. Yeah, I mean, the ability to change perspectives to where it's appropriate, it's both the case that it might be inappropriate, Mm. but also that in the long run, it might be good for some people to be inappropriate in that way. Again, so the philosopher Olivia Bailey and I have been talking about this ecosystem of styles and virtues. And I've been thinking a lot about the fact that I had two mentors in grad school. One of them was very empathetic and kind and would pay attention to my emotional state and change the way she talked depending on if I looked like kind of sad and out of it. And another mentor who was a total hard ass who would be completely blunt and she would rip (laughs) me apart no matter how I was looking or feeling. So there's a sense in which what she's doing is inappropriate for the mood. And you can see situations in which that's rough. But also, it was really good for me that there was a person who I could trust was giving it to me straight, where I could know that they weren't just saying something because they were being empathetic. Mm. So it's really hard because on the one hand, I can see exactly how there are situations where it's like this. On the other hand, I think in the long run, it might be good for people to have that kind of commitment. I think like there are both specific social situations where someone that could never take something seriously would be worrisome. And in the long social run, having those people around are a kind of like resource of unseriousness. And I think what we should think here is like there are people around who their first impulse in a disaster is to make a joke. I would bet on that being actually very socially healthy in the long run. In your book and in the paper, you speak about how during gameplay or playfulness we find ourselves unconstrained by our usual rules i was wondering how far this goes how far we can take this because obviously well maybe you'll disagree in the case of intellectual playfulness we're still going to be constrained by the rules of like language and grammar 
to what extent are we still constrained by the usual rules when we engage in intellectual playfulness? That's a really good question. I haven't thought about. It. Let me let me let me try something. So let me walk up to this slowly. <laughs> so the thing you're talking about in games. So let's start there. It's not that all the rules go away in games. I don't stab my the person playing chess with me because I'm like. So there's this tradition in people that think about games from an anthropologist named Huizinga that thinks about play as happening in a magic circle. Mm. So their idea is that when you enter play, you step aside from some of the normal rules mm. and enter a space where different rules apply and different roles apply. So again, we don't stab people, but like what he's talking about is really simple. I love my spouse. In most cases, I do everything I can to support her. But if we're on different sides on a basketball game, <laughs> I'm going to knock the ball out of her hand <laughs> and that's fine, right? And not only would it be not just weird, but wrong, for me to pass the ball to my spouse if she was on the opposite team. It would also be weird if she swatted the ball out. I was going up for the perfect dunk and she like blocks it. And then afterwards, I'm like, I thought you loved me. <laughs> Annika Warren's version of this is just that game spaces are spaces where we decide to cancel certain rules. Not all of them, but certain rules mm. and cancel certain norms. I mean, this will make me sound like a terrible person, but there are definitely spaces where... You abandon some of the standard social rules of nicety or politeness and you say some weird, screwed up stuff with your friend joking around. And that feels important. And other spaces of intellectual playfulness and you just try out stuff. Well, isn't there a bit of a worry there in regards to the things that some people might end up believing? There might be a bit of a danger here. If we encourage people right. to suspend their usual belief systems, including their moral beliefs if you'll excuse the pun, aren't we rolling the dice on the idea that people will come to defend freedom rather than slavery, to take an example? Can people end up having these morally repugnant views through playfulness when they're not constrained by their, their usual beliefs? This is actually a really good point and a good point of constraint about going all radical, like it's okay for some people to be totally intellectually playful and nothing else. Like I think, I think you're right. I think in many of these cases, Intellectual playfulness always needs to be constrained. The problem is there are two different sides mm. here. One value of intellectual playfulness is that play itself is valuable. And another role for intellectual playfulness is as an exploratory behavior under the larger rubric of aiming at the truth. And if you have that second one, then what you probably need is some kind of alternation between playful states and more rigorous, careful mm. states. Most people who are jokesters also have the moral sensibility of knowing when to turn it off. Mm. This is kind of the deep, hard question of like a lot of these emotional states, like intellectual playfulness, involve turning off certain rules. Mm. And what's good about them is you ignore those rules, except also somehow we also know how to turn them back on. Here's a games example. I think this is something we know how to do. When I play board games with my friends and we're being really intense and vicious, we mostly go all out. I don't <laughs> like hold back from moves we go that's what it is we're an intense board gaming group but if someone's really broken hearted if someone starts crying at the table we're gonna stop hmm. like we know how to pop out of that when the conditions are extreme enough we worry there might be some constraints in relation to classroom teaching as well so you write when i present philosophical theories as worth thinking about because they are gorgeously elegant or deliciously fun then students will actually try them out for a while and that might work for some alternative views, but it can only go so far, surely. The views you ask them to entertain are going to be pretty modest. Otherwise, as a teacher, you're going to find yourself back on the job market pretty quickly. You're absolutely right. Here's a way to put it. Every single intellectual attitude or style has an advantage and a danger. Seriousness isn't going to have this problem, but it has a problem that has narrowness, of narrowness. Intellectual playfulness has the virtue of exploration, but also exactly those dangers of stumbling into and being seduced by an idea because it's fun or elegant. The background worry here has to be that intellectual playfulness is both a way out of epistemic traps and a way into them, right? It's both an insurance policy, but that's what exploring is, right? Exploring can get you out of crap and also get you into crap. That's like, the nature of exploration. <laughs> I don't think I or anybody else thinks you should be maximally playful and never serious all the time. Mm. I've mostly been thinking about how the state is undervalued and getting a description of the value right. Mm. But I also want to point out that there's a downside to constant seriousness and constant moral carefulness at all times, which is a kind of 
narrowness of exploration, right? We need to balance these tendencies. And again, there's this really, if you start thinking down this path, there are two questions. What are the limits of the balance and rebalancing in an individual? And what are the limits in a social world? There's just roles. Like there are roles, there are roles for stand up comedians, we know, and they can act a little bit differently. Like I think there are a lot of intellectual styles. So one thing I noticed a while back is that every single musical producer that I found incredibly innovative and interesting seems to be just nuts. Brian Eno, <laughs> Phil Spector, Kanye, Lee Scratch Perry, all people that change the face mm. of music. And if you listen to interviews with any of them, you start to think if you read this, like maybe the mental style required to do innovative sound production work is so deeply related with this kind of mind expanding openness that I wouldn't want any of them to be president or running the American Medical Association, <laughs> but it's also good that they can make the amazing records they make, right? I kind of think, by the way, that philosophy is a place where you stash people that are much more intellectually playful on average, where we're willing to consider weird, weird ideas. And sometimes we stumble across something like the a horrible mind virus, like long-termism. <laughs> So just the last few questions on games. Uh, the other feature of games that you identify is there being opposed to usual forms of order and rule following. In other words, play and gameplay require us to shift our perspectives. Our boards become worlds. Our friends become witches and wizards. Our once loyal friend after purchasing Mayfair and Park Lane is now our mortal enemy. Is there a delicate balance here? When playing games or doing philosophy playfully between taking the game serious and not taking it seriously enough? You know, one of the really interesting things about games is the degree to which playfulness in games is also related to this weird form of seriousness, but a very specific form of seriousness. And here's what I mean. If you set up a board game night with your friends for an intense economic game and someone comes and they like don't try really hard to win, they're kind of wasting your time in the same way that if you like set up a tennis match Right, And you go there and under the understanding that you're going to play hard and the other person just kind of dabbles and doesn't pay attention. But there's also a kind of over-seriousness where you can care too much about victory. So part of, for me, the interesting paradox of games is that for many of us, the right way to play games involves trying to win really intensely during the game. Mm. But once the game is over, you just kind of let it go, right? You realize mm. the point of the game was to have fun and we all had fun, so that's fine. But the interesting paradox of games is a lot of times to have fun, you have to try really hard to win. So the problem here is that seriousness is a really complicated concept. And there's a kind of limited, constrained seriousness that seems crucial to a lot of kinds of play. And I kind of think the same might be true of philosophy. That's good. It links to a conversation we had on the philosophy of sport with Stephen Mumford. We spoke about his book, the philosophy of football and he gives the example in that about how he's watching a football game and then Ronaldinho starts doing some kick-ups at the halfway line and then he said well he's no longer playing football right you have to be striving to win in order for there to be a game of football and we gave a pushback about how it might be like artistically pleasing to see someone exercising such skill he wasn't too much interested in those rebuttals another one of our previous guests has been quite vocal against the idea of there being positive value in some sports. So Stephen Law has been posting about the negative value of sports and I'll give you a couple of examples. In 2017, during the World Cup, he tweeted, 32 nations, of which 31 will eventually be bitterly disappointed. The World Cup is a recipe for global misery. <laughs> and earlier this year, <laughs> and earlier this year, he tweeted again, saying, sporting competitions are exactly what an evil god would engineer. They maximize misery. For every brief moment of joy enjoyed by one lot of supporters, there's a mountain of disappointment experienced by all the rest. Two things there. I recommend not going to a sports game with Stephen Law. And second of all, <laughs> do you think he might be missing something about the value of striving in gameplay here? Or is he onto something? Are we just creating these misery festivals to everyone to suffer through? I mean, the question of why we play sports is one of the most... Let me give you my answer at the end, but there's so many interesting answers through the history of this stuff. So famously, some sociologists think that sports are basically catharsis for our like homicidal impulses. Norbert Elias says like, what it is to civilize is, a, is basically you find techniques to stash your bad 
impulses and sports is where we stash you know our desire to murder so that's one theory i think scott kretschmer thinks that like the glory of sport is mostly you lose but you always have the possibility of redemption next year and that that's this interesting drama i'm really interested in the difference between valuing the outcome and valuing the process so the key idea from my book about games is that there are two attitudes motivations you might take towards playing a game one you might call achievement play what would you value as winning Mm -hmm. and the other is what you might call striving play which is where what you value is being engaged in the struggle itself Mm -hmm. where desiring to win is just kind of a tool for getting into the struggle one way you might put it is in normal life we take the means for the sake of the ends but in striving play We take the ends for the sake of the means. Mm. I'm a rock climber and I try to get to the top of the cliff, but I don't really care. What I care about is the experience of trying to balance, right? The experience of being really intensely into the rock. I realized that I had a crucial (laughs) non-citation for my book where the core (laughs) – I found – the seed of the core idea that I, in a text I'd read 25 years before I read the book and I'd totally forgotten about it, but I can repair this here. So there's this fly fishing book from John Gierak, who is a beloved fly fishing writer, but also was a philosophy major as an undergraduate. He has this thing about what happens on a day when you are a fly fisher and you fail to catch fish. Mm. First of all, you know, he's a catch and release fly fisher, so he's not keeping it anyway. But, you know, you're getting into it, but you're just frustrated. You're frustrated. You're frustrated. But one of the interesting things about fly fishing, which is a thing I've started doing recently, is how it tunes up your attention. Like the process is very meditative and very intensely attentive towards the natural world. And he has this beautiful description. You know, you, you've been searching the river. You're looking for fish. You're trying all day. You're casting you get nothing you're more frustrated as you're walking back you're just tuned up you hear the deer rustling you're you're smelling the leaves more you're watching the bugs more carefully and then he says and then you remember that catching the fish is the goal but not the purpose of fly fishing right i realize now i read that like 20 years ago and it got planted in my brain and i forgot about it but that's the key idea for me that a lot of us mistake goals and purposes and if you have this understanding of striving play then you realize the goal for a lot of us, is just a temporary tool to get us in the mental state and the process of struggling. I think that Law's view is a reductio of achievement play. If you think the value is only in winning, then it is true that most tournaments are stupid. <laughs> if you think, on the other hand, that there are other values to sport and games which is winning that are somewhere in the process, and that wi- the desire to win is just a tool to be engaged in the process of struggling, then it is not a zero-sum disaster. Can I ask you a yes or no question here? Yes. That wasn't the yes-no question. I'm going to ask you (laughs) you you here. In response to law, is the World Cup a recipe for global misery? No, because most people intuitively understand, both fans and players, that the process of play and watching the process of play is the valuable thing and not the outcome. Let us pause for a wee jiffy to say a quick thank you to all of our sportsman-like patrons for making the show possible. In particular, a very special thank you to Playing Battleships Leads Him Breathless, it's Jamie Lung. Golf's not a sport, it's a way of living. You're looking good in those trousers, Joe Richardson. He's always running into bananas and red shells, it's Matt Carrera. He loves Donkey Kong, but worries about its moral messages. It's Christian Mwunki. His favorite trivial pursuit categories are sport, leisure, and animals. It's Walker Barnes. He thinks Super Mario and Princess Peach just need to have a good smooch. It's Michael Kisley. He spends too much time with his angry Pikachu. It's Neural Surge. Forget Goat Simulator. What about a Sheep Simulator? I know one boy who'd play. It's Anthony Welsh. Playing on the merry-go-round makes her sick to her stomach. It's Elijah Hughes. And last but not least, if real life was a game of chess, he would be the queen. Move in all directions, conquer all his foes, and when he puts you in checkmate, you will feel his power. It's Mr. Jim (laughs) Clare. If you're enjoying the show and you want to help prevent gamer rage, then please head over to patreon.com forward slash pansidecast to show your support. A link's also in the iTunes description. Right. Let's jump back into it. So a final question we have here for you, T, before we go on to some listener questions. Uh, you speak about how a game must phenomenally engulf us if we are able to be able to be gripped by the game and if it's 
thrills and threats are to have emotional punch for us. Like many people, as I've grown older, I find it more difficult to be engulfed by games. Do you have any thoughts on why this happens and how we might be able to rekindle the game flame? Uh, that's really interesting. I find a very different experience. It's become easier and easier for me to engulf by games. And a lot of people actually complain of the other thing, of excess game addiction, of coming out of especially COVID, just being like hmm. able to lose themselves completely. So I, I think it's quite psychologically variable. But I do have a theory, and it's not a theory from my own experience, but watching others about why this happens. And I think it is exactly what we were talking about before. It's becoming convinced of the worldview that something has to have an outcome, a produced countable outcome to be valuable. Hmm. And from that point of view, the whole thing, the whole mess of game playing and play just seems stupid but i think like that's the attitude that needs diagnosis and when you start to diagnose that attitude you can come to be okay with it again thank you to everybody who has submitted a listener question for T. He has promised to answer them as quickly as possible so we can get through <laughs> as many as we can. We've picked uh, well, we've got, got a few here. Ollie, do you want to kick us off with a question that grabbed your attention? Sure. So let's start with Lloyd Addison from Kent who asks, I would like to ask about competitive gaming. Does T think that online gaming brings out the worst in people? Again, the term competitive is so complicated. Mm. When I talked about striving play, I think a lot of people, what they interpret it to mean is, Oh, if you're too into the game, that's achievement play. And if you're kind of chill about it, that's striving play. That's not what I think at all. What I think is a striving player and achievement player can get really, really into the game and completely absorbed in winning. But after the game, the striving player knows that that wasn't really the point. That the point was to be absorbed or to have fun. And the achievement player is like, God damn it, I didn't win. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of reasons to think that <laughs> striving play is, I wouldn't say always the superior form of play, but has a lot going for it. And I think... This view about online play, dismissing it categorically, is a view that confuses these two things. Mm. I think a lot of people that are too obsessed w are dismissive of people being too intense about obsession with online play are probably turned on the other side of the life, completely obsessed with making more money, advancing up ranking the list, getting more citations, getting the next <laughs> bigger car, the salary raise, and that actually the work they've displaced the same unlimited numbers go up attitude to something where it really shouldn't be. Yeah, I think you call that value capture in the book. Is that right? When you, you know, yeah. misplace the how how are you defining it? Value capture is in a word. Value capture. So value capture is the phenomenon where your values might be rich and subtle or in the process of developing. And then you get put in a social setting, typically an institution, that gives you a simplified, typically quantified rendition. And then you internalize that. Right. So going into philosophy out of love of wisdom and coming out obsessed with publishing in highly ranked journals. Yeah. Going on Twitter for conversation and coming out obsessed with tweets. Yeah. So one of the reasons I think that I'm really worried about value capture much more than about games is that games stop and most game players step back from the values of the game. And that's not true of a lot of value capture cases. Good. And when we gamify these real life things, then we can find putting value in the wrong things, right? Yeah. Next question comes from Charlotte O'Hara in Ireland who asks, and this is quite funny, actually, the second part of this question, given the conversation we've had so far, what was the last video or board game you played and did you win? <laughs> I actually, there's a game called Monster Train, which is of a style that is one of my burning lifelong obsessions. It is a roguelike deck builder. Mm -hmm. Roguelikes typically are very hard games where you don't get to save. I, I really enjoy this. Like you, you can't go back. Like often there's all this tension because if you're at the end of a two hour run and you screw up one thing and it, 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 it amps up the intensity, which I like. And it's of a school that's connected to Magic the Gathering. And I can say that last night I was stuck on the 25th level of this game, which is incredible. It is an incredibly gorgeous challenge of exactly a kind I like, and I don't get to do a lot. But my kids were had been screaming upstairs, and I was like, I got to let my three-year-old settle down. And so I turned on the game, and while my kid was tantruming, I finally beat the last level. And I think importantly for me, and this is why I love the game, I had to play perfectly and have like 
15 very clever creative solutions along the way to do it. And I can actually remember each of the decisions <laughs> I made that like got me through the hardest level. Uh, and our final question comes from Jennifer Clancy from Texas in the USA. Uh, she asks, how does the philosophy of gameplay intersect with questions of morality and what ethical considerations arise in the context of creating, participating in, or analyzing games as interactive experiences? It's a great question. This is my professional life now. I'm not sure if I told you, but one of the reasons I'm at University of Utah is it has the world's, I think, second-ranked game design program, cool. and I'm teaching in it. Oh, wow. I am teaching game designers, and so I'm the aesthetics person, and we've just hired another game ethicist and another game aestheticist, and we're giving humanities courses in this game. So this is on my mind all the time. Great. So the standard worries about games are that they promote competitiveness and violence hmm. i think we have a lot of empirical evidence that they don't and that they're about the same as like you know the sopranos like people can hmm. tell fantasy from reality there are an enormous number of technological issues about ethical issues involving gameplay and they're the other ones hmm. they're about addiction i i think grand theft auto is fine i think candy crush is evil <laughs> tim rogers this video game writer and reviewer and incredible intellectual has this comment where he talks about how free-to-play game structure is inherently evil and he says that what it mm. does is it addicts you to the end goal and makes the process of playing annoying enough that you're willing to pay to skip playing. And that's an essentially evil structure. Yeah. My colleague, the game ethicist in our program, Ellie Cohen, has this incredible paper that's coming up about the ethics of in-game purchases. She's really interested in like how a game manipulates your agency by getting you into the climactic moment of the game and then yeah. throwing a paywall. You can't have the battle you wanted unless you... Grind for 50 hours or pay $3 right now. <laughs> so I'm really interested in the ways in which design can be abusive, especially yeah. using the technologies of addiction. One important thing, uh, there's a really uh, important book to read. Uh, Natasha Dauchal's book, Addiction by Design, which studies the intentional design for addiction that comes out of the Vegas video poker design industry. After that book comes out, she gives a lot of interviews where she says the people who design video game poker have been hired by Facebook and Twitter and Blizzard to design the interfaces for social media and for things like World of Warcraft. And so I think there's profoundly worrisome issues about addiction. The, the last thing let me say is what we might take out of games is not violence, but an interest in just making the numbers go up. And the line from my book that uh, I'm the proudest of is I'm not worried about video games making serial killers i'm worried about them making wall street bankers <laughs> that's great and uh if anyone's interested in looking at any of the sources that t's spoken about during the episode they can find links to all of them as always in the description a round of concluding remarks would you like to kick us off mr marley so firstly, T, thank you so much for talking to us today um, about um, your book and your paper. I think your passion for this subject really comes across, and I hope our listeners have been able to sense that. It's been just lovely to get to talk to you about these really fascinating subjects. As someone who is quite passionate about games and has been for their entire life, um, I've been quite ignorant about the literature on it, really. Um, your your work is the first literature I've ever read about it. That literature is really well-researched, engaging, exciting, raises lots of interesting questions. And so just thank you so much for your, your hard work, you know, your good philosophical work you've done on playfulness in games. And what am I going to go away and think about? I think the idea of a environment with lots of different types of thinkers in it is, is something worth thinking about more deeply, maybe even thinking about, you know, not just gameplay, but education, families, more voices around the table, I think is a, is a good thing. And I'm, and I'm pleased that um, your work is promoting that idea i think that's a really good idea and just generally just thank you so much for your really warm and playful and fun attitude towards this interview and your work it's just wonderful to read and it's, it makes philosophy really exciting for people and i think that's just really good public philosophy so so thank you so much thank you i i don't know how to deal with all this flattery I'm <laughs> thank you <laughs> i'd like to echo all of ollie's remarks as well i could sit here and speak to you for another few hours too i've really really enjoyed it and oh i picked up your book originally just to read a little bit to contextualize and read a little bit deeper and see how it connected up with your paper and I just ended up reading the whole thing I absolutely loved it so uh, I'd like to echo Ollie's remarks on that too what will I go away and think about I th I've been thinking a little bit about this playfulness stuff in my day-to-day -day life leading up to the interview 
it led to me having a very long discussion on the philosophy of ghosts the other day at the pub with some friends and i think we went for about three hours talking about if the world's moving and ghosts are these non-extended things then does the earth move away from the ghosts and if you're a ghost and you go anywhere do you just get lost in space and i think i had great fun talking about that <laughs> a lot of it was inspired just by like oh, let's see where this goes after reading your paper just wanted to talk about something which was a, a sort of unconstrained but I was thinking that as a teacher as well, I teach a lot of philosophy of religion at the university. And so often students begin their points with, I'm religious, I'm not religious, and then analyze the content in the light of their pre-existing beliefs. I think your paper reminded me of the intrinsic, but also the instrumental value of just enjoying the discussion and encouraging students to do the same when they're approaching a topic. The point of them isn't just to come to university and try and contextualize everything they learn in regards to what they already believe. Also made me want to play more games. You give loads of great examples of games in the book, which coincidentally leads us to everybody's favorite game, Pop Pop Philosophy Quiz. Pop 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 Pop, 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 pop. Philosophy Quiz. Welcome to Pop Pop Philosophy Quiz. Miss Dolly Marley, can you remind us of the rules, please? So me and T are going to hear quotes from three different important significant thinkers. Uh, and we need fastest finger of, of shouting out the correct name for the thinker. And we'll see who wins. We're playing C.T. Nguyen. C.T. Nguyen. So you've got quotes from a C, a T, and C.T. Nguyen. So your C... Okay is former England and Arsenal goalkeeper David Seaman. Your T is Mr. T, best known for his roles in the A-Team and his 1984 hip-hop album, Mr. T's Commandments. And then you've got C.T. Nguyen, professor of philosophy at the University of Utah. So I want to hear C, T, or C.T. Nguyen. T. People think I'm laid back, but there's a lot of things going on in my head. Mr. T. It's not Mr. T. Ollie, it goes to you. Is that, is that C? Is That's that, C. One nil to Ollie. It takes a smart guy to play dumb. T. That's Mr. T. It's <laughs> one all. I will never forget my first game for England at the World Cup. It was C. Turkey. No, no, I mean Tunisia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's 2 1. Dump the tea leaves in a normal glass and pour hot water. CT Nguyen. Oh, that's CT Nguyen. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Wait for the leaves to settle drink. That was CT Nguyen. It's three, one. Honor thy mother and father. The Bible makes it clear. If you break the rule, God help you, fool. You got Mr. T to fear. <laughs> Stress T. <laughs> three, two. All my best LA memories are about girls that's me. or taco trucks. <laughs> <laughs> I've always liked long hair. My dad's always had long hair, but he always Let's tells see. me. Yeah, yeah. See, as a kid, yeah. I got three meals a day: oatmeal, miss a meal, and no meal. T. It's Mr. T. It's five three <laughs> to T. Only a few left. Golf and fishing. I usually do both at least once a week. The biggest fish I've ever caught was a thirty-six pound carp. I mean, I don't I have no idea. Is that is that T? It's not T. C. No. It's C. It's six three. My first name is Mr. My middle name's period. My last name's T. T. <laughs> You're just too busy laughing, man. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm about just enjoying the playfulness I... of, the, of the game. Again. <laughs> I believe in the golden rule. The man with the gold rules. That's T. That's T, T. you've lost here, Dwali. I'm not even going to give you a, a score. <laughs> well, I enjoyed a, it. A, fi anyway, a so final one. Good. Fixing a broken car engine, figuring out a math proof, managing a corporation, even getting into a bar fight. Each can have its own particular interest and beauty. Is that me? That is you, T. Yeah. I, I don't even remember where that was. <laughs> I have no memory from my own writing. <laughs> uh, it was just a guess. If you'd like to learn more about C.T. Nguyen and his work, then head over to thepansycast.com or go straight to his website, objectionable.net. On both websites, you can also find links to T's excellent book that comes highly recommended by us all here at the pan sidecast games agency as arts thank you to the aesthetics and political epistemology project at the university of liverpool generously funded by the british society of aesthetics for making this episode possible if you haven't done so already check out the interview with rachel fraser on narrative critiques thank you you've been listening to the wonderful soothing voices of mr ollie marley thank you for listening professor ct nguyen Yo, and <laughs> me, Jack Symes. Thank you for listening. See, that was great fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.